Hello, thank you for listening to The Booking Club, the podcast that brings you today's leading authors and commentators from a table at their favorite places to eat and drink. I'm your host, Jack Aldane. On this episode, I'm going to be speaking to Mary Harrington, author of Feminism Against Progress. So we are back, or at least I'm back, here in Andrew Edmonds after two years. The last time I was here, it was with the author of Dominion, Tom Holland. And tonight, contributing editor to Unheard and author of the book we're going to be talking about on this episode, Feminism Against Progress, Mary Harrington. Thank you for having me. And what a treat to be back here. I don't think I've had dinner in this restaurant for about 15 years. So what's your story with this place? Um, When I was a student at university, I ended up working for a very eccentric, now now some years dead, print collector, a man called Christopher Lennox Boyd. He basically spent all of his money on print and ephemera. And he was a he was a world expert on 18th century mezzotints. He never he never cooked. He never ate at home or really fended for himself at all. Um, and so he he'd just go out for dinner literally every night. And he was always in search of people to go for dinner with. And he used to periodically ring me up all the way through my 20s and take me for dinner. And Andrew Edmonds was one of the places that he and I used to come. And and also Andrew Edmonds is in fact a, a print dealer, as well as being a restaurant, which is just a, a lovely combination, which I I, I like immensely. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's for for me, Andrew Edmonds. It captures it captures something of of a disappearing culture and also of my interest in the print era of the 18th century. So I suppose there's an echo there's an echo for me in the print ephemera which are bought and sold, and in the conversations I had with Christopher. You take us back there to your younger years when you were very much a different person with a very different view on the world, because you were once somebody who as you describe it, wanted to live at a tangent to anything that could be considered the status quo, bound up with bourgeois, patriarchal, heteronormative values. Uh, And you were also a bit of a tech utopianist in some ways. You say you essentially lost your faith in progress as a young progressive, ostensibly. What happened then? How did I lose my faith? These, These things happen slowly and then they happen all at once. I'm not sure I could put my finger on what it was first. Um... How were you living your life at this um, time? I, I was I was drifting, it was sort of experimental everything. You know, I was uh, curating art events and living from hand to mouth. And I was I was very very interested in digital art, and I was particularly interested in in media art outside outside the infra- the official infrastructures of art funding. And because there was a, there was this phenomenal subculture of that in London in the noughties. There were people who were experimenting with the ways that the internet can convene um, new social phenomena. And we're experimenting with that in a very playful and very artistic way. You know, before flash mobs became a marketing thing and before LARPing became just how we do politics um, and before before alternate reality gaming became just how we do politics, alternate reality gaming felt like an incredibly creative, potential new form of storytelling. And I, I was just really into all of that and I wasn't very interested in doing what all of my peers at Oxford were doing, which was you know, getting a job in management consultancy and getting on the housing ladder. I mean, with hindsight, I sort of wish I had done that, but I guess I wouldn't be the person I am. And anyway, I mean, it's too late now anyway, so who cares? If you can't point to a turning point, what were the ideas that started to invade your, your sense of equilibrium that led to a, a, a shift? It was more that the people I was around just just started to seem annoying, and the, <laughs> it always starts yeah, that way. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it just, it, things things started bugging me, and it it turned out it turned out that trying to live a sort of radically non non hierarchical way um, doesn't doesn't eliminate power dynamics. Uh, I think that was probably that was probably the the big the big red pill, and that came that came in several in several different ways. Um, trying to live in a radically non-hierarchical way doesn't eliminate power games, and I, I got the sharp end of that. And it just came, it just came to seem to me that um, pretending that, that saying you're doing this doesn't actually, it, it doesn't actually achieve what you think you're achieving. All it does is makes it make make power games more difficult to talk about. That I suppose it left me, it sort of threw me back on on a lot of the stuff I'd internalised from the, you know, the, the the postmodern theories, which I'd really kind of taken far too seriously at university and really found myself grappling with and, and transforming my worldview. 
Um, to be clear, I don't really think of myself as a conservative. I mean, I, I use the word reactionary in a very considered way. That's right. You you yeah. describe yourself as a reactionary feminist. I, I'm, I'm very, very emphatically a reactionary rather than a conservative. Um, Has feminism become a conservative position well, in recent years? It certainly seems to me that many conservatives have never sounded more feminist. There's a lot of different ways of passing that. I'm broad, I'm with Sarah Bachmari on the whole conservatism thing. You know, if you're if all you're really if all you're trying to do is conserve the liberal gains of 20 years ago, mm. then all you're really doing is is pursuing a strategy of losing more slowly. Take us through reactionary feminism then. What is it that you mean when you call yourself that? Well, I mean, it's it start. My my MO has always been meme first and ask questions later. And you know, I, I stuck that on my Twitter bio before I really knew what it meant. And I only really had to write theorize it long form when first things wrote to me to say, can you please explain? <laughs> I thought, oh, crap, I don't really know what I mean. <laughs> I know I mean something by it, and it's, good, it's a good signal scrambler. But what, in fact, do I mean by that? And I think what I mean by that is... That you, what what does it look like to to still care about women's interests if you don't believe in progress? Because because I, I mean if you look at the history of feminism, it's very very difficult to dis disaggregate it from the progressive project. You know, and some people would say it is in fact impossible to disaggregate it from. The, and I and I get this actually from the right as from the left as well and the right both. You know, there are there are right wingers who say, well, you should just call yourself something else, and there are left wingers who are just like, be gone, get the get yeah. behind me. Yeah. Um. And and both of them seem unconvinced by the idea that one could be. Um, not a progressive and also care about women's interests. But but I don't see why the two should be incompatible. So, so part one of the book really focuses on unpacking um, what we had before modernity, because really my argument is that feminism as such is not evidence of progress, or at least you, you don't have to read it as evidence of ab moral progress in some absolute sense. You can also read it as an effect of the Industrial Revolution, and particularly of the way that work left the home during the Industrial Revolution and women's aggregate response to the new challenges that threw up to how 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 to how to be exist while womaning you know, mm. how to exist while female and how to exist in society and family life and so on so that that's part one of the book you know feminism is an effect of the industrial revolution and i've looked i looked at that in the context of how of family formation and of the point where that came to an end um, which which i've i've situated i've situated the end of feminism at the sexual revolution which is kind of counterintuitive from from a sort of mainstream, a sort of normie feminist perspective, um, given that yeah, no, you know, the received view tends to t tends to situate its beginning there, but 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 I see that as the end of feminism, um, because that was the point where the two poles of feminism collapsed just into one, whereas whereas throughout most of the 18th and 19th centuries and half of the 20th as well, um, the the negotiation for of over how how women adapt to modernity really oscillated back and forth between the questions of care and embodiment and questions of freedom and personhood which is by definition um, seeking to escape from the constraints of embodiment um, but this all happened in the context of a basic sh common sh basic shared realism about about sex about dimorphic sex the fact that men and women exist um, but the the arrival of the pill and subsequently of abortion um, definitively tilted the argument in favor of the feminism of freedom because at that point it came to seem conceivable for the first time and also legitimate and also feminist to abolish all the all the distinctions and all the constraints and all the divergences of biological sex and to my eye you can draw a straight line from the arrival of birth control and abortion through to the gender ideology which everyone seems to think has just come out of nowhere but in fact it hasn't and i've traced in part two of the book the the intellectual genealogy back to back to the pill which i, I see now straightforwardly as the first transhumanist moment so let's go back to the 15th century you zero in on the harmonious relationship to skill productivity and the hearth of the home that women in the feudal period were afforded and then how the industrial era where work becomes highly centralized highly regimented and mechanized shatters that harmony separating skilled mothers from their children sometimes with terrible consequences so uh, why is it necessary to go back there? For the avoidance of doubt, I don't want to suggest that everything was hunky-dory, because yeah, the, there's a, you know the dark heart of human nature is what it is, um, and I'm sure there was plenty of violence and misery because the, the, that's that's just part of part of life. Life is tragic, um, so so I don't want to suggest that everything was great in the past and now it's terrible, um, but everything was different in the past. 
Um, and one of the ways in which, one of the very salient ways in which historians broadly agree that it was different was that the, the central economic unit of, of the pre-modern West was not individuals. It wasn't homo economicus as it is now. It was, it was a productive household, um, which would, would consist of, broadly speaking, um, a, a married couple, children, possibly extended members of the family, other members of the household, such as you know, servants or depend, depending on the socioeconomic class. But the, the, but the basic unit of, the house, of, of, of economic life was, was the household. But it wasn't just that everybody was contributing as one household to the economy of that time, right? It, it, was, it was the fact that women's role within that, you say, had some real benefits to women. The central change that, that happened with the industrial era was the work left the home. Um, and and that that threw that, that that left women with some pretty fundamental dilemmas. Dep- again, depending on class. But in the book, I've given the example of textile making, which was women's work for twenty thousand years um, prior to the industrial revolution. Um, and and I've quote I've cited an historian who gives a who gives a lovely picture of why 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 it makes sense for textile making to be women's work. Um, it, I mean, if you imagine if you, you've got kids underfoot you, you maybe got a baby and a toddler and some assorted other small people running around um te- you can you can make if you if you're weaving on a hand loom you can do that while you're keeping an eye on a falling baby you can let you can raise the loom off the ground you can do it while you're talking to your friends or your cousin or whoever it, it's social work it's interruptible you can you can you can baby proof it to to a reasonable extent um, and it's and it's essential work for the family. You know, people need fabric for all, for all, all the things that people need fabric for. Yeah. Um, but then along comes the Industrial Revolution, and people invent incredibly amazing, efficient new means of producing fabric. Um, however, these these amazing, efficient new means of producing fabric involve large, dangerous, expensive, centralised machines. So you can still you can go on making textiles. But you, but all of a sudden you have a choice that, you, that you, you're faced with a problem that would challenge that you never really had before, which is what do you do with the baby? Um, previously, that's just not been an issue at all because you were chatting to your friends and you were weaving in the household and you were probably doing a thousand and one other things besides. You, you had a loaf of bread on the go and you were tending a small holding and you were doing a whole, a whole bunch of different stuff. All of a sudden, you're, you're, you've been booted off your land by the Enclosure Acts. So you've got to earn a living doing something. So you've got to work for a wage and that means working in a factory. Uh, probably, if you're if you're working class, what do you do with the baby? And and this this set off a whole new set of dilemmas for for mothers. Um, and and so so of course this this then impels whole new political movements that are, that set out to address this. And then further up the social hierarchy, um, those women who could afford to uh, just opted out of work because children still still needed looking after. And there we get the cult of domesticity. Yes, and, that, that, yeah. and, and I read that straightforwardly as a variant of feminism. The reason it, the reason the cult of domesticity doesn't read as feminism now is because the feminism of freedom won. So, could I please order the ox tongue starter? And Mary, what would you like to have? I'll have the duck please to start, and then and then the gnocchi. And for me, it'll be the. Oh, it'll also be the gnocchi, I think. Yes, thank you very much. So, skipping back quickly to the feudal period, the social role that women played also gave them a sort of power that we don't tend to attribute to them. This is possibly one of the more provocative hunches that I have that I've, I've set out to make the case for, where I have suggested that prior to the industrial era, um, not having formal political power for most women was less of an issue. I mean, I, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to claim that it was never an issue, but Illich, in, in the, his book Gender, argues that although in theory, you know, if you look at anthropological studies of agrarian communities, what typically happens is that men have formal power and, and are, are t- one of, part of men's work is engaging with the outside world. In practice, uh, the balance of power is ambiguous, complementary, and fairly even. Um, because women have ways in, in a community like that, in a village, in an agrarian village community, women have ways of, of, of exerting their own power, but they do it informally in ways which are much harder to trace. And I imagine, as an historian, much harder to much, much harder to find evidence for. Because if 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 you get your way via whisper networks, via controlling the access to information within your community, or by public publicly shaming somebody who isn't doing what you want them to do, that doesn't really leave a politi- that doesn't really leave a record in in the historical archive in the same way as who gets to vote, or who gets who or who holds the title to what land, and so 
my hunch is that the picture, the, the political balance of power at the granular level between men and women prior to the modern age um, is actually a much more fine-grained thing and is a much more, much more complex and much more even thing, frankly. Um, than is than is sometimes suggested by by historiographer by progressive historiographers. So, so so women in agrarian societies could lead the charge against somebody who had deviated from the accepted norms of a group and as you say a culture of shame the sort of original council culture although I'm sure council culture goes back to the beginning of man would be largely adjudicated by the women folk of that group. Butting against this idea that all women in the medieval period were silent, illiterate, fearful, and likely to face physical assault if they ever resisted their husbands. I I don't buy that idea. I mean, you don't don't even need to go very deep into medieval literature. I found a a lovely poem um, from, from from the Middle Ages where where the ploughman comes back and he complains to his wife about how hard he has to work um, and, and how she's just sitting at home twiddling her thumbs or whatever. And she, she gives him what for. She says, while you've been out at work, mate, I've done... And this is a, this is a stock story where they swap roles for the day. Um, and she goes out to plough and, and maybe it doesn't go so well, but he ha- in the meantime, he has to look after the baby and he has to get the bread baked and he has to do a thousand and one other things. And it all goes horribly pear-shaped. And this is this is a sort of stock um, medieval ro- role reversal comedy story, and the end result of the story is that everybody accepts that you know the the work is different, but it's all the work, and actually it's all quite skilled. But also, I mean, if you look at if you look at figures like the wife of Bath in Chaucer, mm. she is not oppressed. And well, yeah, I mean, she's she's off several husbands possibly, or at least she's 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 buried several husbands under possibly questionable circumstances. But she's having a fine old time in middle age. Another previous guest on the podcast, Marianne Turner, has just released a book about the wife of Bath as a, as a kind of medieval feminist icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so many stock medieval characters mm. who are incredibly strong women and incredibly rambunctious women as well. I mean, there's a whole genre of medieval cookledry comedy. Hot young women who are married to middle-aged men and, and the, the, just the, the antics that people get up to. Um, you know, there's, there's, so, there's so much going on there which just gives the lie to this, this sort of magazine feminist idea that medieval women were sort of permanently stuck in a skull Bridal. Would you uh, be for sort of modern adaptations of said comedies as a kind of a new reading for, for, for young girls? Growing I mean, it might be might be very maybe interesting. So you should pitch uh, it to the BBC, maybe. Yeah, it is worth a go, I guess. How was your starter? You had the. Could you remind me what you had again? I had a coffee duck with chicory and cornichons, which was lovely. So you've spoken a lot already in the course of our conversation about feminism of freedom. And of course, many listeners, many people who identify as feminists would sort of say, well, is there any other kind? Feminism against progress is, as you mentioned earlier, feminism against the pill. Now, that statement alone will surely be anathema to scores of modern women. And if we just could imagine them for a second all getting up and putting on their coats and heading to the exit, what could you say or what would you say to get them to pause, to rethink and just hear you out? Um, when you manage to escape a limit that seemed previously like a hard limit and you use a technology to do that, the, invariably you end up with a huge dividend, dividend of freedom that comes with that, you know, whether that's the automobile or you know, any, any one of a thousand and one other innovations which have transformed the way we live but by, by busting through what seemed previously like a hard limit, like how fast you can go. But um, what's, what's perhaps more difficult to discuss is what the trade-offs are. But specifically in the context of the pill, my, my frame for thinking about it is that technologies of liberation are invariably also technologies of capture. Um, and to the, to, in, in direct proportion to how, how, how completely a, a new technology liberates us, it will also open up new terrains for, for the market, which might previously have been governed by um, human limits or, or social codes. And if we think of it as a technology of liberation and also of capture, um, it's, it's, it, becomes, it becomes easier to see how those benefits and costs fall out um, because they're not symmetrical. In the context of the pill, women like me, by which I mean middle class, academically inclined, you know, moderately ambitious in one way or another, the contraceptive pill was, was straightforwardly a net benefit. But um, one of the perhaps less well-appreciated trade-offs of of the contraceptive pill is that by by making women's sexuality a private matter rather than a public matter which was really what it did it privatized women's bodies when you privatize something the owner can do what they whatever they want with it 
which means that to the extent that something becomes privatized, it, it also becomes possible to buy and sell. And so concurrently, it, it's not a coincidence that the, that the sexual revolution wasn't just the, the advent of women feeling that they, they, they alone owned their own bodies. It was also the advent of big porn. The privatization of women's, of women's bodies is also the commodification of women's bodies because freedom and trade are two sides of the same coin. And private ownership, private autonomy and, and commerce are two sides of the same coin. And it's not possible. The, the 60s utopians and the, the second wave utopian feminists genuinely believed that they could have the sexual liberation without the commerce. And it's just not true. I mean, if you look at any other, any other area where we've liberated ourselves from some limit through technology, you will see that the market moves into the space absolutely without fail. It's just, it, it's, it's ineluctable because something comes, comes in to fill the vac vacuum and it turns out to be trade. Because it releases a lot of human energy and it allows for a lot of yes, human impulse. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. It releases a lot of energy and, and people, people seize on that opportunity and they do whatever they want with it. And of course, and Champions in, yeah. of Progress say when that happens, we should sell it because right, it because shows us what we are really like and what we're capable of and for better or worse it's human beings doing human beings which i suppose is one way of looking at it but i think that's that's the kind of up, upbeat john stuart mill optimist way of looking at it i mean he was he was all for you know the people with social capital and intelligence and a measure of personal self-discipline conducting experiments in living and he was he wasn't so concerned i don't think with what it would, what how it would be like for people with poor impulse control or chaotic family backgrounds or less social or economic capital to have the guardrails taken away um and I suppose at this point a progressive might say, well, who are you to, to be paternalistic and to impose guardrails on people who you're obviously looking down on? And you think, well, you know, do you have eyes and a functioning brain? Can you, you, do, you not see, do, you, do you not see what happens when this goes wrong? Every single time we've, we've tried to abolish human nature through technology, um, all that happens is that the, that facet of human nature that we've tried to abolish comes back as a set of supply and demand problems. And in the book, I've set out a few instances of, of where, we, where we see that dynamic in action. I mean, you, you, see, it, you see it happening in the so-called so sexual marketplace there. Well, in, in, which, in which many women are truly happy. What if this book is really, not for all women, but for some women who feel compelled by the liberal norms of today, against their better judgment, a bold and unapologetic alternative to that. If I'm completely honest, I think I'm more I'm more using feminism as a as a vector for critiquing the market than I am using the market as a vector for critiquing feminism. This is a very sidelong way of of, of, do, of doing political theory. We can't challenge you one can't, without the other. You can't really disaggregate them. There are no. lots of feminists out there who, because they are progressives, hate capitalism. They think they hate capitalism, but if you believe that the good for for women or for men and women or for people in general can best be pursued by destroying interdependence between people by chopping by chopping each of us as individuals up into our separate little bubbles and then even chopping our bodies up into separate components and then trading them frictionlessly you know according to individual will and desire you're essentially applying the logic of of day trading or of of financialization to to humans um, it, it, it's structurally exactly the same mindset and and I struggle to see I, I sincerely I'm sincerely baffled as to what anybody imagines could possibly be progressive about that where do men fit into this because I know that you obviously you address men in the chapter called let men be and uh, a lot of barbs are thrown at feminists today from uh, what you describe in the book as embittered anons on the manosphere who haven't exactly welcomed the about turn made by feminists in recent years about single sex spaces. Well, are they wrong to say, look, you know, feminism has hollowed out all of our spaces on the insistence that wherever we go, whatever we do, women should be able to go and do as well. Why look to us for sympathy when the same is done to you? That was really the question that I set out to answer, because it seems to me it, it struck me as a as a structural blind spot. Um, certainly among more left-leaning or more basically liberal gender-critical feminists than I am. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a common sentiment. If, 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 you spend any, and if you spend any time at all around uh, internet anons, um, it's, it's not unusual to hear some variant of, you've made your bed, ladies, um, so you can lie in it, fuck you. I think if we're going to be realistic about, if we're going to be realist about the fact that men and women exist, and that we're not the same. You know, we're not that different, actually. But nor are we the same. Um, if we're going to be realist about that, then we need to do it across the board. Uh, not just, not, not just as, a, as an acknowledgement. 
well, we, we, we need to be realistic about it across the board because I think there are a number of undercounted costs of the, the, the women's movement would do well to look at and reckon with where it comes to the downstream effects of making all of social space uh, co-ed, un unisex by default. Um, which is which is broadly speaking true now. There are very few there are very few single sex spaces, and those single sex spaces that exist tend to be for women. I mean, it's I mean the, the, I'm sure somebody will stand up and say, well, what about the Garrick Club? You know, what about what about rugby clubs? You know, there are plenty of places where men still get to hang out together, but actually there are there are nowhere near as many as there used to be, and I think this is particularly palpable the further you go down the social scale. Um, I mean the the working men's clubs are not single sex anymore. There are men are men are getting lonelier. That's right. What is it? Uh, something like uh, just under a third claim to have six or more close friends. Yeah, the number of close friends that the men, on average, report having has been declining steadily for decades. And and I I can't prove it, but I think there's a there's a connection between that and the fact that social spaces are now mixed sex. Um, I think there are there are there are kinds of male friendship which I don't I don't claim to understand or have any special insight into you know, not being a man, but there are frequencies that, in my observation, men socialise on which are just on just inaccessible to to women. I mean, the, an example I've cited elsewhere is um, you, I, I run a lot. Um, I run I run cross country in my local area and do a great many miles, and sometimes I'm, I'll be running I'll be running along a footpath through a field. And I'll see the, the local the local detectorists society out and about, and they they tend to they'll be spread out. There may there'll be maybe ten of ten of them, and and it struck me as as I was running past them one day that they're socialising, like this. I, I, they're doing it on a frequency which makes no sense to me, and that just doesn't really read as socialising from a woman's point of view. What is but, it that doesn't read as socialising? Is it is it the is it the lack of talking? The fact is they're it, not talking to each other. You imagine you imagine you know men go fishing again, very right, silent talk occupation, but, but they're spotting. socializing. Yeah, and it, it just happens <laughs> on a frequency which makes which is inaccessible to women, because that's just not really that's just generally broadly. So, I mean, you know, I don't want to I don't want to say never, but on average, that's just not how women roll. Um, and I, I mean, I read you. You see these articles that appear periodically that say, "Oh, you know, men. If only, if only men would get over their toxic masculinity and go to therapy and talk to one another a bit more, you know, they wouldn't be so lonely and miserable." And I'm like, you know, maybe if we left them the fuck alone to go and be detectorists in a field, they wouldn't be so lonely and miserable. Like, it's possible. It's just possible <laughs> that we're looking at this wrong. Um, and so when I say let men be, I literally just mean that. So if progress has taken us in a direction of ever freer, more atomized and bodily autonomous individuals, yet we've become lonelier, more dislocated, and it's become harder for us to form long-lasting relationships built on trust and solidarity, then feminism against progress must be feminism for something. And what would you call that? Some of it starts with being being willing to, to let men be. Um, not least because if we want, if, if it's, it's clearly in women's interest for there to be some good men. And it's also clear to me that women don't form good men. You know, good men form one another. And again, I don't really understand how that works, but it's, it's a thing that I've just seen happening. Older men will teach younger men how to behave. Um, this, is, this is not something women could do. Um, I, I actually think this is one of the reasons why why single single parent, which in very almost always means single mother, households tend most fruitfully to produce um, delinquent young men, um, sim simply because mum, mums just don't have the same effect. It lands differently, and I don't understand why, but it just does. It just uh, that's just that's just how things are. And I mean, you uh, you could you could set yourself as a feminist against that entire edifice. And say, well, you know, we, it shouldn't be like this, and so we're going to make it not like this. But I just don't think that's going to work. I'm, I'm skeptical that we can we can change something that seems so fundamental. And given all of this, um, if we want that, to, if we want good men to exist, then we have to step back and let them form each other. Um, and assuming assuming we manage to do that to any extent at all, I think we're leaving the age of we're leaving the age of abundance behind. I mean, we kind of already have. A great many of the cards are collapsing all around us, um, and given all of that, yeah. What um, does it mean for the sexes? Well, 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 if if I as if I were twenty two today, I'd be and I was female, and I was thinking one of these days I want to have a family. I'd be thinking, holy fucking shit! 
you know, how am I ever meant to feel safe enough to have a kid? And I, and I suppose if there were one thing I would, I would say to a woman like that, it would be you, you need to prioritize somebody who's going to show up for you. You know, not somebody who's going to give you the warm and fuzzies or somebody who's going to like be a thrilling bad boy or, or, or any of those things, but somebody who's going to show up for you. And, and you know, a, a precondition for that, as I've already said, is, is, is that we, we give good men the space to form one another, um, such that there are even any men existing who, who, who want to show up for, for their spouses and for their children. But assuming, assuming that happens at all, you know, if, if you spot one of those and you form a relationship with one of those, hang on to them, hang on to them. Um, those men and women who've come to the, who've arrived at the point where they feel like they've been lied to and something's just very deeply off about the direction that we're heading in and that actually maybe, maybe something a bit warmer and a bit, bit closer and a bit more intimate would be better. You know, we're all, we're all going to be reverse engineering it from scratch. You know, and we're all we're all going to be starting from a pretty broken place. So we're just going to have to be very compassionate with one another and pretty pragmatic and willing, willing to accept a measure of brokenness in our in our loved ones um, and, and just do our best to manage it. Putting it like that, Mary, I think perhaps your best next book is the great romance novel of our time <laughs> about how men and women put together the pieces of all these broken promises over the last century. But it's been wonderful to speak to you about this book. It's a hard one, I think, for a lot of people to get friends who are not already cognizant of the arguments you're trying to make to read. Is there anything you would say to kind of sum up why anyone who dismisses it at face value should just pause and take a closer look? At the end of the day, um, nobody has to listen to me. Um, but I suppose I'd, I suppose I'd say this. Um, I was an early adopter of a lot of the stuff that I see as just endemic in the culture now. Um, you know, the sort of rootless internet, internet selfhood, and um, very grievance and power-oriented identity politics, um, gender questioning, the limitless optionality, uh, very radically unstable lifestyles. Um, I did all of that. Um, and and I did it with the sincerest of intentions um, because I felt like it was gonna it was gonna be it was the right way to live. And I came to the conclusion that it's just not. Um, it's not true. It misses out almost everything which actually matters uh, about being being a person and flourishing as a person. Um, I was incredibly fortunate um, just by by hap by sheer happenstance um, to have reached escape velocity just in time i mean i i'm I, I have a i have a happy home life now i have a child um i can do in i'm in a sense i'm more bounded and more constrained now than i was at that time but in so many other ways i'm not you know i'm, I'm not a prisoner of i'm not a prisoner of my whims in a way that i used to be um i have a i have a purpose in life um and it's it's the it's the strangest and bitterest irony really of the lot that I spent my whole twenties longing to become a writer, and it wasn't until I gave up on it and set about trying to be a, a, a useful and valuable person to the, to my the loved ones around me that I actually found enough stability and enough coherence and enough internal. I'm not even sure what the word is. So in, in, internal consistency and internal peace. I think peace is the word I'm looking for. I found enough internal peace to be to be able to do that. And it landed in my lap completely unexpectedly at the age of 40, and I feel phenomenally blessed for that. You know, and, and I'm not saying that all, all you have to do, all, all you have to do is get married and have a child, and then so everything will fall into your lap, because it's not possible to make promises like that. But um, uh, what, what, I, what I do feel very confident in recommending is that if, if, if you feel like you've been conned, if you feel like you've been lied to, and radical optionality is just not really delivering, then another life is possible. And if, I, if, if, one, if one young man or woman reads my story and the, my reflections on my story and takes a different path without sustaining as many scars as I did, I'll feel like I've done something worthwhile. So, so that, that's, that's really the message I'd leave with. Mary Harrington, thank you very much. 